All right, welcome to the podcast. We are starting this, I say we because it's copper in me both. Um, we are starting this because I'm impatient and I don't want to wait until February 1st. Plus with the playoffs occurring this weekend, um, I wanted to have my first podcast be my favorite topic and that is sports, particularly football. Uh, because I am a football junkie. All right, so we're going to be looking at um, this weekend's playoff games. And hang on just a sec. Starting off with the Bills and Dolphins. Now, I have really been rooting for the Bills. In fact, I was since the beginning of the year, was rooting for the Bills to reach the Super Bowl. Even though I am a Chiefs fan, they've already won it. You know, so the Bills never have. I would like to see them make it to the Super Bowl and win it. Although at this point, I'm not sure anybody can beat San Francisco, but we'll see. But after the game against the Dolphins, where the Dolphins are using a third string quarterback and came pretty close to beating the Bills, um, that left some real question marks. Of course, it hasn't helped that the Bills have lost some people, uh, particularly Von Miller, who was brought in to help them be, you know, be a closer at the end of games. Now he's out for the year. So, but I, I would just have some real concerns uh, because Buffalo is inconsistent. That's the bottom line. They are very inconsistent. And as much as I'd like to see them make the Super Bowl, I just don't know if they can. Um, we'll, we'll see next week, you know, because um, Cincinnati has to go to Buffalo next week. Although I'm not as scared of Cincinnati as I was with three of their four offensive linemen, starting offensive linemen out. Um, I think that gives Buffalo, plus the fact that they're playing at Buffalo, I think that that gives Buffalo the edge. I still think it'll be a good game just because the Bengals have so many weapons but and Josh Allen is, is I, I really like Josh Allen because, number one, he played at Wyoming, you know, which is, of course, a bordering state to Idaho and a smaller school. And so you got to root for somebody like that who, you know, in his first couple of years were a little iffy, but he has become such a, such a, a good player and a dangerous player. He's very dangerous. But honestly, um, I still think that Kansas City is the team to beat. They ended up with the best record, and they ended up with the bye. So they didn't have to play this weekend. They're going to be well-rested. But you can be well-rested, but also be a little rusty, you know, with the week off. I've seen that happen many, many times. But... And, and really, the Chiefs don't really have any injuries to be nursing right now, so that I'm aware of. But it's going to be tough. But the thing is, if Buffalo de does beat Cincinnati, the Kansas City Buffalo game is going to be played at a neutral site, which I still don't quite understand. That to me, the team with the best record should have the home game. I just I don't understand. And there's a lot of other people didn't understand the NFL's thinking on that either. I mean, I understand having to make adjustments, but when you have somebody that even if Buffalo would have won the game against Cincinnati that was canceled, Kansas City would still have the best record. So I don't see what the problem is of playing the championship, the AFC championship game in Kansas City. That doesn't make sense to me. They're going to be playing at a, new, at a neutral site. And, and I, so far... If they've decided on the site, I haven't heard about it yet. I haven't seen it on any of the talk shows or on the news or anything like that. 
but I think it should be played at Kansas City. Although, I would like to see Buffalo win, so I guess if they played at a neutral site and don't have to put up with the KC crowd, that's going to be a plus as far as the as far as the Bills are concerned. But I just I don't think it's fair. I don't like the way the NFL handled this. Number one, they made a rule change during the season, which is setting a really, really bad precedent. Normally, changes like this uh, occur after the season, and the competition committee gets together and they, you know, decide on the new rules. You know, which the owners, 24 of the 32 owners, have to vote on it to pass it. Uh, I don't like the idea of them passing new rules. You know, it just sets a bad precedent. Because now, anytime they're like, well, you know, we did it before. You know, once once you do something the first time, it makes it much easier to do it the second time. Which is like committing a crime. It may be hard for the person to do the first time, but then the second time it's easier because they did it before. So, anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Um, the Jags and Chargers. I was rooting for the Chargers because I've always liked the Chargers. I loved it when they went back to the old white helmets that they used to have when I was growing up. And like when John Hadle was the quarterback. Or number 21 at quarterback. <laughs> I thought that was cool. But um, I liked the Chargers. But I liked Justin Herbert because, you know, he played for Oregon. Which I live right on the border of Idaho and Oregon. I live like three miles three miles from the border, or actually on one end, actually two miles on, on another side from Oregon. So, and I always liked Justin Herbert. I always thought he was a good kid, and I wanted to see him do well. And Trevor Lawrence needs a haircut. Um, I just, anyway, of course, so does Justin now. But um, I was really rooting for the Chargers, and I thought it was going to be a runaway. Here the Chargers have a 27 to nothing lead at halftime. How, and here's the thing, Brandon Staley's supposed to be a defensive coach. Where was the defense? Well, part of the problem is when your offense is not sustaining drives, your defense doesn't get a chance to rest. That's why it's good to be able to run the ball. I was watching a show this morning and they were saying in the second half, that the Chargers ran 33 plays. Of those 33 plays, 25 of them were passes. 25 passes, 8 runs. And they've got a good running back in Austin Eckler. Now, <clears throat> you have a 27 to nothing lead. What you want to do in that second half is take all the time that you can. You want to run the ball. You don't want to run quick plays. You want to run the clock down. You want to wait until the last possible second to snap the ball. You want to run clock. At this point, clock is the most important thing. You got a, excuse me, you got a 27 point lead. All you got to do is, you know, keep playing football. But instead they're out there passing the ball. See, and this is what happens when you have a defensive head coach. In this day and age, the defensive head coach, the teams that have defensive head coaches, other than maybe Buffalo, don't do well. And the only reason Buffalo does well is because of Josh Allen. But you got Brandon Staley, who, you know, he got a head coaching job because, you know, he did such a good job coordinating the defense for the Rams. I remember when they made the hire, I did not agree with it. There was other candidates that I thought there, there were offensive minds that were much more qualified, that would have been much better fits. I've said the whole time that he was a bad pick to put him as head coach. But I guess maybe part of that too is because since he had not been a head coach before, he came cheaper than a brand name, so to speak. But that dude needs to go. I'm sorry, you have a 27 to nothing lead in the playoffs in the first round, and you score 27 points in the first half, you score three points in the second half, you throw the ball 25 times, only run it eight. I'm sorry, that dude needs to go. It, 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 he's proven 
you know, he finally made the playoffs this year, but one and done, one and done with the 27-point lead at halftime, that's just inexcusable. I don't care. That is inexcusable. You need to get somebody in there who is an offensive coach and, and preferably an innovative offensive coach that knows how to win. Because it's a certain, you look at the good coaches, look at like Brian Dayball, who went to the Giants. You look at him. He knows how to win. They played such a good game. They really did. They really played such a good game. And Brandon Staley, it's obvious he doesn't know how to win. There, there's a technique to it. There's a, um, I don't want to put it, a philosophy to it. All right, you've got coaches that just know how to push the right buttons, how to call the right plays, how the, to do what it takes to win. They know how to utilize their personnel and play to their strengths. And yeah, Justin Herbert is a good passer. But you, but why throw it 25 times and run it 8 when you have a 27-point lead? Your main thing is to run down the clock. And you're not going to do it throwing a bunch of incomplete passes. You're going to extend the game and, as a result, allow Jacksonville to get back into the game and eventually come back and win it. All right? Brandon Staley's a defensive coach, but yet he allowed 30 points. In the second half, of course, again, part of that is because the offense couldn't stay on the field. The defense got tired. I mean, that's the bottom line. But also, I don't think Brandon Staley's cut out to be the head coach. I really don't. I think he needs to go. I'd like to see him bring in Sean Payton or Jim Harbaugh, who apparently was interviewed with the Broncos. They need to bring in somebody who is innovative, who knows how to win. At the same time, you got to give props to Jacksonville. Trevor Lawrence had a horrible first half, but in the second half, and this is another thing too about coaches. The good coaches know how to make adjustments. And you got Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson just flat out coached Brandon Staley. Just flat out coached him. You gotta remember, Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. He won a Super Bowl over Tom Brady and the Patriots with the backup quarterback. The guy knows how to coach. And you saw how his team responded. 20, down 27 to nothing, boom, they didn't blink. They came back and won it. So you've got to give Doug Peterson, who I really like, he used to be a backup quarterback for the Packers, back when Favre was quarterback. And in fact, Doug Peterson is the one who, when Favre's father died, Doug Peterson is the one that broke the news to Brett that his father had passed away. So they were pretty close. Uh, I don't Favre's got himself in some hot water now, which I'm not too thrilled about. But, hey, you know, don't do the crime if you can't do the time is the way I look at it. All right. Seahawks, Niners. Which you saw my reaction to the first half. Um, I'm really glad I didn't take my reaction to the second half. There would have been some language. Um I was not at all happy. But I'll be honest with you, I do not see anybody beating the 49ers. I mean, the only team that I could see possibly beating them is the Chiefs, which they did the last time they met in the Super Bowl. But this is a different team. And I have to say, I am extremely impressed with Mr. Irrelevant. Brock Purdy, who was the last pick 
in the NFL draft. And that guy, is, he's 6-0 and now as a starter. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt, and they thought, oh, Niners are out of it. Not so fast, my friend. That guy has been playing lights out. And, and, and that I guess that's the advantage of a quarterback who hasn't been spoiled by somebody else. He's a rookie. He comes in. Kyle Shanahan takes him, molds him, teaches him exactly what he wants to do. Not that Brock Purdy can't improvise. You've seen him, I've seen him get away from, from the pass rush and extend plays and throw it downfield. And he does an excellent job. He reminds me a lot of Joe Montana, although Joe Montana wasn't what you call super mobile, but he was, you know, one of those that he was, that was deadly. Once he got outside the pocket and was scrambling, he kept his eyes downfield and he was deadly hitting those passes downfield. And I'm seeing the same thing with Brock Purdy. So he might end up being the Niners starting quarterback from here on out. And their first round draft pick who hasn't been able to stay healthy his first couple of years, Trey Lance. I kind of have a feeling they're going to be dealing him because the games I watched Trey Lance play, he didn't impress me nearly as much as Brock Purdy has impressed me. I also honestly think that the Seahawks, now I, I like Geno Smith. I was glad for him this year, but he is not a, a kind of quarterback that's going to lead you to the Super Bowl. I really think the Seahawks need to either, I don't know if there's anybody in next year's draft or this coming year's draft that is any better. Um, I'm really not super impressed. Uh, and, and anybody I think that the Seahawks are able to get are not going to be around by the time the Seahawks pick unless they trade up. But I really think they need to improve that quarterback. You know, no offense to Geno, but he's just not, you know, if he was all that great, he, he would have been starting for somebody all these years, I believe. Okay, Giants and the Vikings. Now, here's another guy that I got to give props to, and that's Daniel Jones. Everybody thought he was washed up. He, the Giants got criticized. They picked him sixth overall in the draft a few years ago. And he hasn't been all that great. He's been Mr. Fumbleitis for the most part. But in comes Brian Dayball, who did such a great job with Josh Allen in Buffalo. He comes in and takes over as head coach of the Giants, and you're seeing a completely different team. They've been a joke like the last three or four years. This year, they ain't no joke. Now, I'm not a Giants fan, but I have to be impressed with the way Daniel Jones... And in that game yesterday, dude just took it over. Him and Saquon Barkley, I mean, it, but Daniel Jones, I mean... It's like you could tell what their game plan was. If the Vikings were going to play man-to-man, -man, Daniel Jones was going to look, nobody open, boom, I'm taking off. If there's an opening, I'm taking off and running. And he ran for like 70-some yards. I don't remember what it was. The guy had, a, had a, just an awesome game, which is something that, you know, now Kirk Cousins, you know, the Vikings, they said he completed 80% of his passes, but... It's not the percentage that's as important as when you complete them. And at crunch time, we still had the same old Kirk Cousins. He needs, it's fourth down and eight. He needs eight yards. You've got to get somebody to the sticks. You can't throw a five-yard pass on fourth and eight. And that's what he did. He threw it like five, six yards, and boom. Immediately, Hawkinson, their tight end, got hit and drugged down. And that was it. That was the ball game. Sayonara. See you later. I've been saying the whole time, I was just telling my best friend, Mark, 
I told him, I said, I just really feel that the Vikings are going to be one and done. They're too inconsistent. I mean, you're not, a, to me, a Super Bowl team, a Super Bowl caliber team doesn't get blown out 40 to 3 by the Cowboys at home. They weren't even playing at Dallas, they were playing at Minnesota. Got blown out 40 to 3. I don't remember what the score of the Lions game was, but they got blown out by the Lions. I mean, totally blown out. And then they got blown out by the Packers. So you got, you got blown out by two teams that didn't even make the playoffs, the Lions and the Packers. Sorry, you get blown out by teams that don't even make the playoffs? Um, you're not a Super Bowl caliber team. I don't care what anybody says. And that was proven yesterday. I mean, they played, you know, they kept it close, you know. They played a fairly good game, but with their record, they were the first, uh, was it the second seed or whatever it is? Second seed, I believe what they were, and Giants were the sixth seed. Yeah, the Giants just fought out, you know, played a better game. And I kind of expected the Giants to win because I just, I've been saying, you know, I was saying told Mark yesterday morning, I said, I said, I just have a feeling that it's the Vikings are going to be one and done, that the Giants are going to beat them. And they did. Now, Ravens and Bengals. I have to hand it to the Ravens. They played a really good game. And the only reason that the Bengals won was of that fluke play where the Ravens quarterback tried to jump over the pile, got the ball knocked out of his hands. He thought he made it past the goal line. He didn't. He didn't. He was still about a half a yard short. The ball was knocked out right into the hands of Hubbard, who <laughs> ran it all the way in for a touchdown, and that was the difference in the game. I mean, Cincinnati really couldn't do a whole lot. They only mustered 17 points. Their offense did. So... The only reason that they won that game was because of that fluke play on defense. But, you know, that's the thing. You're a team. You're not just offense. You're not just defense. You're a team. And so sometimes it doesn't matter how you won. It's the team as a whole and what they did to win the game. Now, here's the problem. Cincinnati has lost three of their four starting linemen. Well, I know there's five, but but the four, there's four. Anyway, three of their, three of their linemen are out. Was it was three or four. I can't remember now. Maybe that's where the four came from. But I know at least three of their starting linemen are out, and their best ones. They're both their tackles are out, from what I understand. So... They really had a hard time protecting Burrow last night. A real hard time. He he didn't have that that great of a game. He never had time to throw. You know, they were all they were all over him all game. Now they've got to go to Buffalo. They got to go to Orchard Park and play Buffalo at home with the Bills Mafia. That's going to be tough. Now, if Cincinnati had all their starters, they've been pretty much the hottest team that, you know, a lot of people were picking them as being the best. But now that they've lost their starters, lost their linemen, I'm thinking Buffalo should win this game next week. Buffalo should win it. If they don't, you know, but you never know. You know, that's why they play the games. Because you just never know who's going to win. Now, let me just say something about Lamar Jackson. Normally the Bills starting quarterback. This guy's all butthurt over his contract. Number one, he's never had an agent. His mom has been his agent. He's all butthurt about 
not getting this contract. But look, what it, he's missed the last now, now six games, including the game last night. He's missed six games in a row. Last year, I think he missed five or six games. But yet, he wants a contract commensurate with what Patrick Mahomes has. I'm sorry. <laughs> he is not worth that much money. And I have said from the very beginning, when he was drafted, I remember when he was drafted, he was talking about, oh, we're going to win the Super Bowl. I remember thinking at that time, you ain't never going to win a Super Bowl with this guy because he does not have the skills. Now, yeah, he's fast. He's got great running skills. Oh, yeah, he won an MVP, uh, but the year he won MVP, they were one and done in the playoffs. I mean, put it this way, Lamar Jackson has won one more playoff game than I have. Yeah, he's only won one. You're not going to get to the Super Bowl with this guy. You're just not. He doesn't have... How do I put this? The, the instincts, the passing acumen. Oh, yeah, well, he doesn't have the weapons around him. Yeah, but even when he had the weapons around him, he didn't do crap. Yeah, he's good during the regular season, but during the playoffs, when people are able to just concentrate on stopping him, He's won one game, and he barely won that. You're not going to get, and by the way, he could have played last night. He comes out with this tweet saying, oh, my knee's this, my knee's that, my knee's that. I was watching a interview yesterday, and, and T.J. Hushmanshada, who was, used to be a wide receiver, I remember him most with the Bengals. He knows a lot of players on that Ravens team, and he says that he's been told, he says, I know this for a fact, Lamar Jackson could play, but he doesn't want to. The doctors, have, he said, the doctors have cleared him, and that's why you've seen John, uh, John, Har John Harbaugh, when he's been asked questions about him, just kind of like, I don't want to get into that. Yeah, because he knows. He knows. He knows Lamar's been cleared. Now, he doesn't come out and, and throw him under the bus and say that to the public. But the locker room sure knows it. And you saw some comments made by some of the players last night. If we would have had Lamar, you know, they know what's going on. They know. And there were several of them that told TJ, yeah, the doctors have cleared him. He could play. He's good to go. Regardless of what he says in his tweet, he's good to go. The doctors have cleared him to play. He just doesn't want to. Why? Because he's butthurt about his contract. Now, to me, and here's the thing that just pisses me off about these pro athletes. They're making millions of dollars, and they hold out while they're still under contract, wanting a new contract. And it's like, to me, you sign the contract, Frickin' play. If you are under contract to play, you need to be playing. This crap of, well, I want a new contract, so I'm going to hold out and not play. That's horse crap. You know, try to get away with that in <laughs> real life. All right, you sign a contract, you're obligated to honor that contract. But yet pro athletes can say, no, I don't have to honor the contract. I want a new one. It's like, they're so spoiled. God, I would like to have the money that they're making under the current contract. Holy crap. You know, it just, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us would. Most of us would. All of us would. But I think that Baltimore's either going to trade him or just let him go. Because I think they realize by now they're not ever going to win a Super Bowl with this guy. He's hurt. Two years in a row now, he's hurt. Multiple games. Not half the season, but damn close. And so, in his style of play, as he gets older, he's going to be hurt even more. And I don't think he has the skills to begin with. Yeah, you know, he can 
kind of pass, but he's not, he's just not the kind of quarterback that, I don't know, I just haven't seen, I've never been all that super in, impressed with him. Um, and now him holding out when he could play and not going in and playing and basically letting his team down, I think, I got no respect for that. Got no respect for that. On the other hand, there, I have the utmost respect for Jalen Hurts. Now, I'm not an Eagles fan at all. I don't dislike the Eagles, but I'm not a fan. Jalen Hurts, you talk about character. You talk about somebody with character. This guy was replaced in the national championship game, was pulled and replaced by Tua Tagaloa, who threw the winning touchdown pay, pass to Devontae Smith before Devontae Smith became the Heisman winner. So he got pulled. Now the next year, Tua was the starting quarterback. And then in the championship game, Tua got hurt. <laughs> Man, Tua got hurt? <gasps> How rare. Jalen Hurts was put into the game. Jalen Hurts played exemplary. He was by far the MVP and led Alabama to the national championship. Now, after the game, this is the only player that I've ever seen make Nick Saban cry. Because Nick Saban, after the game, when they were interviewing him, Jalen was standing there. And Saban started going on and on about how when he was pulled, he never Jalen never griped, he never whined, he was a man, accepted it, never gave Saban any trouble, was still the model player, the model citizen, the model teammate, and Nick Saban was so touched by that that he started crying, talking about him. You could tell. Saban thought, this guy is amazing. Jalen Hurts, it didn't matter what people said about him. He just, you know, he, he never tweeted back. He never, you know, tried to defend himself. He just was like, yeah, well, I'll just go out and play, show you. He ended up transferring to Oklahoma, had a great career at Oklahoma, and then got picked in the second round by the Eagles, which everybody thought, why are they picking him? Because they had Carson Wentz. Yeah, why are they picking another quarterback? I remember at the time, I'm thinking, well, it would be lucky if he even makes the team. And his first year, he didn't, he didn't do bad. But he wasn't, wasn't all that great either. But then that's, that guy, he worked his butt off. And now, his, what used to be his weak point, throwing the ball, I think is up on even level with his running the ball. The guy is just pure character. Pure character. I have the utmost respect for that guy, even if he did play for Oklahoma, which my best friend's an Oklahoma fan. I used to be a Nebraska fan, so I automatically hate Oklahoma. <laughs> but you have to respect Jalen Hurts. You really do. That guy, I mean, if I had a, a team of players that had his character, we'd never lose a game. Seriously, we would never lose a game. 
that guy, you know, um, and I guess that of the teams left in the NFC, the Eagles would be my pick to go to the Super Bowl. If they did make it to the Super Bowl and Buffalo made it to the Super Bowl, I would have to be rooting for Buffalo. Because the Eagles already won one. It took them a lot of years to do it, but they finally won one. But that guy, I just had to give him a shout out because the guy is just so impressive. I mean, I, I really respect men with character. And that guy has more character in his back pocket than most people do in their whole bodies. The guy, and I know he's hurt, but the one good thing about the Eagles having the bye is it gives him another week to rest that shoulder. But we'll see. Um, the, the one thing, now the game tonight, I don't like Tom Brady, never have liked Tom Brady. And I would love to see the Cowboys stomp them. Not that I'm necessarily a Cowboys fan, but I just want to see Brady get beat. I mean, my word, they got into the playoffs with an 8-9 and nine record. How, I mean, that shows you how bad that division is. That you can win the division with a losing record. And so, if they had a different playoff format where you didn't automatically go to the playoffs because you won your division, the Buccaneers wouldn't be in the, in the playoffs. Just simply wouldn't. So, yeah, I, I just, I, I really hope the Cowboys beat them. Just, I want to see Brady get knocked out. I can't believe the dude's still playing. 45, I mean, you got to hand him this, though. The guy's 45 years old and still playing well. And he's planning on playing next year, too. Probably not with the Bucks though. There was a lot of conjecture where he'd go. Right now, they're talking about him going to Las Vegas, to the Raiders. And also, Rob Gronkowski is talking about coming out of retirement. So if Brady goes to the Raiders, Gronk probably will go, too. Because they seem to be a package deal. <laughs> but that's all right, because I already don't like the Raiders. So that would just give me one more reason to not like them even more. Okay, well, that is my take on it. So now we're going to get Copper's take. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's going to be the Chiefs. I like the Chiefs because Patrick Mahomes gave me a biscuit. And I like biscuit and I like red. And the Chiefs are red. And I like, I like the Chiefs. And I like, I like Kansas City because, yeah, because I don't really care. As long as they give me a biscuit, I don't care. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, they give me a biscuit. <laughs> and a biscuit. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. That's all I got to say. Talk. We will talk to you next time. All right.